Hello dear students, welcome to the autumn semester of academic year 2020 and 2021. It's unfortunate that because of this pandemic, we will be interacting virtually for this course. However, you need not to worry and feel free to contact me whenever you have any doubt or problem. I am Atib Ahmed Khan. Assistant Professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering since 2016. I along with Professor Nashad Alam will be taking this course which is MEC 3110 or Machine Design 2. I am teaching this course since the last four years. Now the prerequisite for this course is Machine Design 1 which you must have already completed in your sophomore year. Before we actually start with this course, let's see what are the course objective, syllabus and course outcome of Machine Design 2. And after that I will give you an overview of the syllabus of this course, what are the different components we will be covering in this course. So starting with the course objectives, course objectives are basically the objectives or the points which are kept in mind before designing any course. And then we go for the design of the syllabus and then the course outcome. So the algorithm is to design the course objective first, then the syllabus and then obviously the course outcome. Uh, in, in an easy way, I can say that, in an easy language or in a layman language, I can say that the course objective describes what a faculty member will cover in a course. So this is a brief, this will be a brief, this objective you can say will be a brief, uh, brief introduction of your syllabus. So for this particular course MEC 3110, we have three different objectives. The first one is understanding the process and methods of design of machine elements. So in this course we will teach you how to de design the different machine elements for example your welded joints, clutches, brakes, springs and your gears etc. Your second course objective is abilities of developing equations pertaining to the design of machines. Obviously, for if you are going to design any machine elements, you will be writing some equilibrium equation, you will be drawing some free body diagrams, and then you will be writing some uh, force, you will be equating some force in the x direction, y direction, then you will be equating some togs, etc. etc. So, all these things we will be teaching you in this course. And the last one is knowledge of different materials and their properties for designing the components of machine elements and the ability to design new machines and modify the existing machine. So this is an extension of your first course objective where you have an addition that you will, you will get some knowledge of different materials which will be used in, in for example in some machine elements for example your clutches, brakes etc. And then you will be able to, we will teach you how to design new machine elements and also how to modify the existing machine elements. So these are the three course objectives which were kept in mind while designing the, this course. Uh, I along with uh, Professor Noshad Alam has uh, uh, modified this course as per the changing needs of this, of this, of the industries. And uh, you are always welcome to give any feedback regarding the course objective, the um, syllabus or the method of teaching if you are not able to understand or if you want some change in the method of teaching. So you are all, be, always feel free to contact me or Professor Nashad Alam. So coming to the course itself, there are four, this complete course is divided into 
four different units. The first one is welded joints, clutches and brakes. The second one is bearing and lubrication. The third one is springs. And the last one is gear train. Now, you can see that the first and the last unit are written in bold. And uh, those two units will be taken by, my, be taken by me. So the first unit, which is welded joints, clutches and brakes. And the last unit, which is gear train, will be taken by me. And obviously, the second and the third unit, bearing and lubrication and springs, will be taken by Professor Rashadar. Now, the first unit consists of just a second. Okay, yeah. So the first unit comprises of uh, this uh, course structure, and the course outcome is basically what you as a student will be able to do or what you as a student will achieve after going through this course. So, for example, if you complete your first unit, which is your welded joints, clutches, and brakes, you will be able to design different clutches and brakes and you will also be able to design and analyze different welded connections now this is what you as a student will be able to do after going through this course so course outcome is completely different from course objective course objective as i told you basically describes the components which a course instructor or uh, or the teacher will Will, will be going to teach you in the due course of the of this uh, course and course out outcome is uh, is what you as a student will be able to achieve or what you as a student will be able to do after going through this course so for after after completing the first unit you will be able to design different clutches there will there are different types of clutches which i'll tell you in a moment and different types of brakes and you will be able to design different welded connection subjected to different types of loading so this is the course content of this uh, unit the first one is types of welded joints so i'll give you a brief idea about what different types of welded joints are there there are basically or broadly you can classify the welded joints into two different types the first one is bud joint which is shown over here and the second one is your uh, lap or fillet joint so bud joint is a joint where you can see that this is your plate number one just a minute this is your plate number one and this is your plate number two so you can see that in bud joint the, both the plates are kept in one plane and the welding is done along the edges of the plate i believe you have already done this type of welding in your freshman year in your uh, manufacturing lab so i and if i am correct uh, you must have done uh, you must have done a v butt welded joint there are the different types of uh, butt joint and uh, we choose the type of butt joint depending upon the thickness of the plate so you will learn all these things in the coming lectures but uh, for the starters you can say that a butt joint is a joint where both the plates are kept in one plane and the welding is done along the edges now another type of welded joint is a fillet joint or lap joint so as the name suggests uh, as the name suggests the lap joint is a joint where one pl plate is kept over another plate a part of a one plate is kept over a part of another plate this is your plate number one and this is your plate number two you can see that a part of one plate is kept over a part of another plate 
now the welding is again done along the edges if the welding is done along one edge this is known as transverse single transverse fillet uh, sorry single fillet uh, joint or single lap joint and if the welding is done on both the edges then the this type of uh, welded connection is known as double lap joint now there is another uh, what do you call there is another categorization of uh, lap joint that is basically dependent upon the type of load or the direction not exactly the type of load but the direction of load which is applied on the fillet joint now suppose your plates are subjected to an axial load p in the direction shown in this figure now you can see that the direction of the force is perpendicular to the direction of the weld the direction of the weld is in this direction and the direction of the force is in this direction so this particular type of since we are having welding on both the uh, both the edges so already this this when this type of connection is double lap joint but since the direction of the force is perpendicular to the direction of this uh, welding therefore this type of welded joint is known as double transverse fillet joint or double transverse lap joint okay now uh, suppose suppose the direction of the load or the force is parallel to the direction this is the direction of the weld okay and this these two are the direction of the applied load so if the direction of the applied load is parallel to the direction of the weld this type this particular type of connection is known as double parallel fillet joint now obviously the analysis of both the joints are done in a different way and in the, obviously in the coming classes you will learn how to do this analysis but for now I can tell you that the transverse fillet joint which I showed you earlier fails because of the tensile load and the parallel fillet joint which is shown over here which is shown over here fails under the shear loading and uh, the cross section of this welded connection or this welding is assumed to be a right angle triangle and uh, your welded joint will always fail across the the, 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 cro the minimum cross sectional area because that's the point where your welded joint is weakest and uh, obviously any connection fails from the point where it is weakest so it will always fail at the minimum cross-sectional area now in this first unit i'll also tell you about uh, the advantages of using welded joints over riveted joints and uh, one of the disadvantages of the welded joint are the residual stresses which which uh, basically arises because of the uneven heating and cooling of the of the of the machine member or the plates or because of the localized heating and cooling of the machine members or plate now this these residual stresses can never be uh, never be made equal to zero but they can obviously be reduced by uh, by some practice so there are methods which are known as pre-welding methods which are done before welding and there are methods which are post-welding methods which are done after welding so one of the pre-welding method is preheating the plates before doing the weldings which basically uh, basically reduces some uh, up to some which basically reduces localized heating and cooling to some degree and uh, the post welding method is annealing of the structure 
so depending upon the shape of the structure and the complexity of the structure we choose the post and the pre welding method for reducing the residual stresses and always keep in mind as i told you residual stresses can never be equal to zero there will always be some magnitude of residual stresses but they can significantly uh, they, they can be significantly reduced to uh, to a small magnitude by using these methods now <clears throat> as i told you that there are only two there are uh, broadly two types of welded joint the first one is your butt joint and the second one is your fillet joint they are further divided into subcategories which i'll cover in the coming classes now the second thing which i'll which i will cover is that in this type of welded joint you can see that the load the, the direction of the load is passing through the center of gravity but in the coming classes we will also design and analyze and, uh, and analyze the welded joints which are subjected to eccentric loading okay and eccentric loading for example if your load is not acting over here rather a load is applied at some some position at this place so you can see that this time your load is not the direction of the load is not passing through the center of gravity and this type of load is known as eccentric load now you can see that this particular type of load is in the same plane as that of the uh, well uh, as that of the well uh, uh, as that of the plates so this type of uh, this type of loading is known as is in plane eccentric loading had it been over here like this so you can see that this particular load is not in the plane of plates rather it is perpendicular to the direction uh, or rather it is perpendicular to the plane of plates this particular type of load is known as out of the plane eccentric loading so we will see the the calculations or the analysis of this eccentric loaded welded joints is a bit complex but uh, nevertheless you will you will find it quite easy after i'll teach you and uh, the analysis obviously for this particular load which is acting in plane and this load which is play acting out of the plane is completely different to give you an idea what we do is that basically we shift this eccentric load and we put it in at a place where it passes through the where the line of the force uh, passes through the center of gravity and since uh, since we have shifted this force from here to here there will be a moment which will be induced in this okay there will be a moment which will be induced in this you have already you you have you have already known this concept since your freshman year so this is nothing new but uh, i'll 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 teach you how to do the further calculations in order to get the results for this type of loading so this is what i'll cover in this welded joint design of simple and eccentrically loaded welded joints <clears throat> now coming to the second part of this unit and uh, before i start explaining the second part i would like to tell you that this first unit is significantly bigger than your fourth unit so i'll take a longer time to finish this first unit than your fourth unit similarly your second unit is significantly bigger than the third unit so coming back to the course content the clutches and brakes so a clutch is a machine member used to connect the driving shaft to the driven shaft so that the driven shaft may be started or stopped at will without stopping the driving shaft i'll repeat once more a clutch is a machine member used to connect the driving shaft to the driven shaft so that the driven shaft may be started or stopped at the will at your own will without stopping the driving shaft now this driving shaft 
is basically connected to the engine and driven shaft is connected to the wheels. So clutch is basically used to engage and disengage your driving shaft from the driven shaft without stopping the engine or without stopping the driver shaft. Now there are different types of clutches which we will discuss in detail in the coming classes. Uh, the, the, the first one is your positive clutches which have positive drive and by positive drive I mean that there is no relative motion between the two members of the clutch or between the driver shaft and the driven shaft. There are different types of positive clutches which I'll show you in the coming classes. But for now, you at least know what uh, what exactly is your positive clutch, and the major disadvantage of the positive, the, obviously the advantage is that there is no relative motion, there is no slip motion between them. But the disadvantage is that it cannot be engaged uh, or disengaged at high speeds. For for uh, for low speeds, it's, it's it performs very well. But if you try to engage or disengage it at a large speed, it will it tend to break <clears throat> now another type of friction another type of clutch and depending upon the type or uh, depending upon the shape of the positive clutch they are categorized into different categories i'll show the different types of positive clutches in the coming classes but for now let's move on to the another type of clutch which is friction clutch now obviously as the name suggests this friction clutch uses the the force of friction in order to engage and disengage the clutch now the friction clutches are categorized into two categories single disc clutch and multiple disc clutch if the number of friction plates is one in any friction clutch it will be categorized as single friction clutch and if the number of plates or the friction plates are more than one in any friction clutch it will be categorized as multiple friction clutch now there is another category of friction clutches which is dry friction clutch and wet friction clutch now as the name suggests the dry friction clutch are not are basically air cooled you need not uh, to introduce and in, you need not to put them any oil bath or any coolant you, you need not to put any coolant over it in order to cool them whereas the wet friction whereas the wet friction clutches are dipped in an oil bath in general the plates are smaller in size for wet general wet uh, friction clutch and obviously if any clutch is wet it will be having multiple discs so you can say that we the friction clutches are broadly divided into two categories dry single friction clutch and wet multiple disc friction clutch now this wet multiple disc friction clutches are used in motorbikes whereas your dry single clutches are used in heavy uh, automobiles such as trucks etc now the since this uh, wet multiple clutch is dipped in an oil bath therefore the load carrying capacity of the wet, uh, wet uh, multiple disc friction clutch is reduces significantly now in over here you can see that a uh, multiple disc friction clutch is shown you are having one friction plate this is your second friction plate and this is your third friction plate okay and these are your pressure plates the first second and third one obviously when the number of plates or the number of friction plates are more than one we categorize that type of friction clutches as multiple disc friction clutch so this is your multiple disc friction clutch Now there are different components of a clutch. The first one is obviously your lever in case of uh, a motorbike or a pedal in case of your car. 
The second one is the diaphragm spring. The third one is your pressure plate. And the fourth one is your friction plate. Now there is another component which is a clutch release bearing which when you press your lever or uh, pedal exerts a force on the diaphragm spring. So this is your fifth component which we call as clutch release bearing. Now if you are not getting what I am trying to explain there is no need to panic because I will be explaining the construction as well as the working of the clutch in a much detailed manner in the coming lectures. This is just to give you an overview of the clutch. Now a, this was all about the working and this was all about the classification and the working of the clutch. Coming to the design of the clutch you also need to design the clutches. So we will be using two different theories to design the clutch. The first one is uniform wear theory and the second one is uniform pressure theory. Now always keep in mind you will always use uniform wear theory until and unless mentioned otherwise. Because uniform pressure theory is only valid for new clutches and it is not valid for the, for the, for the old clutches. Because as the name suggests, we assume that the pressure on the pressure plate, the pressure on the friction plates is uniform in case of uniform pressure theory, which is not the actual case in case of old clutches. So always keep in mind that you will always use uniform wear theory to design your clutch until otherwise mentioned in the examination. Now there is another type of clutch which is cone clutch, which is obsolete nowadays, but from the it, from from this uh, course point of view, or from the from the no, from the analysis point of view, it is important. That's why that's why I'll be covering cone clutches as well. And uh, then there is another type of clutch which is centrifugal clutch. So your centrifugal clutch basically works on the centrifugal force. As you keep on increasing the centrifugal force, there is a point at which the engagement of the clutch. Uh, the, there is a point where the clutch engages. So basically the engagement and disengagement of the clutch depends upon the speed of the motor. Okay. So these types of clutches are used in your lawn mowers and I will be explaining you uh, the, the, the detailed working of these clutches and the analysis of this design and analysis of these types of clutches in the coming classes. Now coming to the other component of this unit which is which, is, which are brakes. Now I have, I have already explained to you that we are going to use we are going to design multiple and single plate clutches, cone clutches and the centrifugal clutches. Now coming to the brakes Brake is basically a mechanical device used to absorb energy possessed by a moving system or mechanism. Okay, so what we do when a car is moving and we hit the brake, so the, the idea is that the brake absorbs the kinetic energy of the car and tries to reduce the speed of the, of the, of the automobile or bring it to rest. Now there are different types of brakes which we will cover in this class. The first one is hydraulic brakes, the second one is electrical electric brakes and the third one is mechanical brakes. Now from the course point of view the mechanical brakes is uh, is the only are, are the only is the only category which we are going to use for design and analysis purpose. The other two are just for the information point of view. Now I will be uh, I will be explaining you what are disc brakes. There are the two different types of disc brakes. The first one is axial disc brakes, and the second one is radial disc brake. The first one is used in the in the in our commercial bikes, and the later one is used in the racing bikes. 
obviously since the, the later one or the radial disc brakes are used in the racer bikes they have better performance they have better efficiency and obviously they are more costly than the axial disc brakes after that we will move on to the energy equations for the brakes we will try to derive the energy absorbed by the brakes and then we will move on to the classification of the brakes and the design of the brakes now for, for in this course we will design only two types of brakes the first one is block brake and the second one is band brake so this was all about your first unit which will be taken by me now moving on sorry now moving on to the second unit which is bearing and lubrication which will be taken by professor noshad alam the course outcome of this unit is you will be you will be able to select and design appropriate bearing as per the requirement and as per the design so there are there are situations where you might use a roller bearing and there will be situations where you 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 are forced you will be using ball bearings so after taking this unit you will be able to you will be you will be able to classify what type of bearings you are going to use for this for the particular requirement now the course content of this particular unit includes laws of friction and uh, lubrication laws of friction lubrication which will be hydrodynamic and hydrostatic so uh, this these two terms are very important hydrostatic and hydrodynamic the uh, lubrication and bearings because in and the major difference between hydrostatic and hydrodynamic is that in case of hydrostatic uh, you you a cons constant pressure is supplied to the to the bearing whereas hydrodynamic uh, bearing are self sufficient and then you will be studying the design and uh, design of ball and roller bearings and then the method of load estimation and selection of bearing so this part is again very important selection of bearing which what are the type of or which is the type of bearing which you are going to select for a particular like a particular need or particular requirement so so this was all about the second unit of this course now getting back to the third unit which is springs so this unit again will be taken by professor nashad alam uh, this unit the third one and the second one now after taking this unit you will be able to identify and design the type of spring as per the requirement for example this spring shown over here is a tension spring whereas all the springs shown over here are compressive springs so after taking this unit you will be able to identify different types of springs as well as choose the appropriate springs as per the requirement so this is the course outcome of this third unit and the course content is the design of helical springs design of torsional springs and leaf springs leaf springs are basically the springs which are there at the rear axle of the trucks you have seen you you must have seen them they are in the shape of leaves kept one one over another and then you will also get an elementary idea about the rubber spring in this unit so this was uh, your third unit now let's get to the last unit of this course that is the the fourth unit which is your gear train 
Now, as I told you earlier, the first unit and this last unit that is gear train will be taken by me. And after taking this unit or after the completion of this unit, you will be able to design geared transmission system. Now, the geared transmission system which we will study or uh, which we will, which I'll teach you in this course are basically of spur gear train and helical gear train. These two, I, I will teach you about these two gear trains. However, we will see the different types of gears, what are their use, why, uh, and in what are their, and what are their applications. Now, this unit is comparatively easy. You will be having empirical formula for different conditions, and using those formula, you will design a spur gear train or a helical gear train. Now, over here, you can see two different spur gear. This one is a bigger one and this one is a smaller one so the bigger spur, uh, spur gear is always known as a gear and the smaller one is known as pinion so this is a combination of gear and pinion the smaller one is pinion and the larger one is gear so this is an example of spur gear drain whereas this is an example of helical gear now you can see that in case of spur, spur gear the teeth are cut parallel to the axis of rotation of the gear whereas in case of helical gear the teeth are cut at an angle to the axis of rotation of the gear now because of this angle the engagement in case of helical gear is smooth as well as the disengagement is also smooth so the noise which a uh, spur gear train makes is significantly higher than uh, the noise made by the helical gear train and this is because in case of helical gear train the engagement is smooth as well as the disengagement is smooth whereas in case of spur gear, gear train the engagement and di disengagement both are abrupt now there is a disadvantage in case of helical gear train because of this angle there is a side thrust which is exerted by one gear over the other gear. Now this disadvantage is overcome by a double helical gear or a herringbone gear. Now you can imagine the double helical gear as two opposite helical gears placed side by side. Okay, you can see that the angle of the helix is or the angle of the tooth is in this direction as well for, as, well, as well as for the other side it is opposite of this direction now because of these two opposite direction the side thrust coming from this this part is cancelled out by the side thrust coming from this part both the part cancels out the side thrust coming uh, side side thrust so the net side thrust acting on the other gear is equal to zero so this is the advantage of using helical gear. Likewise, I'll tell you what are the applications when when we'll go through this uh, this unit. I'll tell you what are the applications of double gear and warm gear. Warm gears are generally used uh, for attaining large speed reduction. Now the course content of this unit is power transmission with two gears, selection of different types of gears. As I told you, as per the requirement, you will be able to select a appropriate gear and what are the different gear materials which you will be using or which you can use and the different forces acting on the tooth and again we will see the nomenclature of the of a gear which is very important and lastly the design of different types of gear so we will see a spur gear train the design of spur gear train and the design of helical gear train and obviously after taking this course you will be able to design both these gear trains so this was all about the course MEC3110 or machine design 2 I have elaborated the course content the course course objective 
and the course outcomes. I hope all the three things are clear to you and in case you have any doubt or any problem or if you want to give any feedback regarding the teaching system, you can always email or uh, email me or you can even WhatsApp me. The, my WhatsApp number as well as my email ID is given on my web page and I also want you to just a second I also want you to join the yeah I also want you to join the WhatsApp group which I have created separately for A section and B sections these are basically two different links if you will click on click on them you will be redirected to a whatsapp group which i have created for a section and b section while clicking on the link please be careful that you click on the correct link if you are in a section then click on the first link if you are in b section then click on the second link so this was all about the brief introduction about the course about the uh, course content and in the next next lecture i'll start with the first part of the first unit that is your welded joint thank you